we can all do our part, plant mall space garden or a container garden, while others of us, this may mean plant several acres of native plants. I want to welcome you all today. I am Jennifer Fishburn, a horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension. And today I will focus on plants that will work in small spaces as well as traditional landscape spaces for pollinators. So first of all, I think we need to define what, a what is a pollinator. The decline of the number of monarchs has heightened our awareness for the importance of pollinators. So why are they so important? Many of our food crops we eat depend on insect pollination. Pollination is transfer of pollen from a male part of a, to a female part of a plant of the same species. This can happen within a flower or flower to flower. The transfer of pollen within the same species often results in fertilization. In other words, we usually see a fruit on a vegetable or fruit plant, or we might see some kind of a nut. Insect pollinators can include ants, bees, native bees, honeybees, beetles, butterflies, moths, and wasps can also include birds such as hummingbirds. And inviting pollinators to your garden can be a rewarding experience. To create the habitat needed, gardeners need to include nectar and larva food sources, which we'll talk about some of those today, a place for them to raise their young, shelter from wind and predators, so this may mean shrubbery or trees nearby, as shallow, a shallow container filled with rocks or compost and sand combined with water for a water source. Anything deeper or like a bird bath would um, be detrimental to bees and butterflies. We need plants that provide a sequence of blooms from spring until late fall, a diversity of flowers, and if possible, if you have a small space garden or a raised bed, leave a small pile of wood for nesting and leave some of the ground uncovered as these areas could be used for ground nesting bees. In the fall, if possible, leave plant residue in place for overwintering insects. And most importantly, educate your neighbors on why you are creating a small space pollinator habitat. Pollinator plants can be, very, can be varied. Most native insects prefer that we plant native plants um, over introduced species. If you're looking to create a habitat for insects from egg to adult, native plants are the best option. Today though, I will also discuss annuals, perennials, herbs, fruits, and add a few natives. Also just wanted to make mention, uh, while we won't have a large discussion on it, I just wanted to mention that we may also consider uh, pollinator and bee friendly lawns. This means that we might want to rethink what is a weed. A moderately maintained lawn has great potential for pollinators. So a term that's being used is slow your mow in terms of using um, increased mowing height and an and a, um, increased time in between mowings. This will allow dandelions and Dutch white clover to bloom. An example would be if you wait two weeks to mow, which will be difficult for some of us, you would increase uh, uh, bee species by potentially 60%. Also consider larval food sources for you know, uh, the pollinating insects. Before we run out to the garden centers and purchase our plants, we should first assess the potential garden location. If this is going to be a small garden or a raised bed, you'll want to observe how much available sunlight, whether it's morning or afternoon sunlight or shade, what the soil conditions are, which might require having a soil sample 
um, tested to find out uh, what your pH is and what nutrients are available and how much space you will have available for gardening. If you're growing in containers, you'll want to observe how much available sunlight that you have. Container gardenings are attractive and they're useful for those of us with patios, balconies, or placed in a garden for our added accents. So they're a great choice for folks that have little or no garden space or those that may have limited mobility. The success of your container garden is going to depend on several things. One is proper site location for the plants. The, the presentation today we will cover mostly full sun to part shade plants. The container needs to be appropriate size for the mature plants that you'll be growing. So if you're growing sweet alyssum, you'll need a small container. If you're growing a blueberry bush, you're gonna need a much larger container. In a container, you also need to make sure it has drainage holes. This is a must. If it doesn't, see if there's a way that you can add those to the bottom and make those a quarter inch size holes. Also be sure to put plants with the same growing needs in the same container. You, you want to make sure that they all like full sun, that you're not including shade plants if this is a full sun container. Also, I can't stress this enough, but make sure you're using a quality, sterile, lightweight potting media as your mix. Most of our plants will like it well-drained and they don't like to have wet feet. Also be sure that you have a water source nearby as on those hot, dry, sunny days, uh, moisture will be quickly evaporating from those containers and you'll need to be um, adding that sometimes more than once a day. If you're growing in vegetables and containers, keep in mind that you should replace that potting media every year. We recommend that for most plants, but vegetables, um, that's almost an absolute must. Here are just a couple examples of uh, thinking a little bit, maybe outside the box for a couple of these, but containers and raised beds. So in the upper left, we have a raised bed, um, which has several tiers. On the top right, we have a milk crate with weed barrier placed inside and then the potting soil mix. Bottom left is a burlap sack lining a milk crate again. And then on the bottom right is a grow bag. Grow bags are a type of a fabric and that fabric allows uh, soil aeration and root pruning. So if we are gardening for pollinators, what are things that we need to be thinking about? Obviously not all plants are created equal. So before purchasing our plants for your small spaces, do a little, your whole work, which is what we're going to do today, but research what plants you may be considering or research which plants um, may be the most beneficial for pollinators. Look for selections that have hefty, heavy nectar or pollen producing flowers. Consider bloom times so that you have something in bloom as many months of the growing season that you possibly can. If you're planting larval food sources, you're going to need to be willing to accept plant damage. And the last thing I'll mention is to rethink your use of pesticides. What I'm saying here is before making pesticide purchases, identify the pest problem. Could you control the pest by hand picking it off? And also be sure to read the label before purchasing any pesticides on how you're going to properly use those and what they could be used on. So this is a plant that many of us may be familiar with. This is butterfly milkweed. As we can see in the picture here, we have butterfly milkweed in bloom and a monarch butterfly larva munching along the leaves. Looks really nice. If any of you though have garden and had larva on your plants, this 
next picture might be what you have also got to see for a butterfly milkweed plant. If this bothers you, I would probably not plant, in, uh, plant put plants in my garden that larva will eat because this, um, this plant will relief. Uh, and this is why we also uh, will say to make sure that you have multiple plants. Um, so a grouping, a clump. So we would want at least three milkweed plants here so that the caterpillars, when they're done munching off, off of this one, can move hopefully to the next one for more food. So let's talk about some annuals. And what is an annual? An annual is a flower or plant, excuse me, that will grow flower and seed in one year. They can typically be direct sowed into a garden. And many annual plants will, if allowed to um, go to maturity, can shatter seeds to the soil and those may come up the following year. For example, in the picture here, we have some what I would call old fashioned zinnias, those will um, shatter seeds to the ground, which can be a good thing for most of us. It'll mean a supply for next year. Most annuals will bloom all summer long. So that is one great benefit for our landscape spaces. However, some of them will need deadheading for to have these continuous blooms. This simply means removing the dead flowers. This is um, not a new plant, but one of my new found favorites. This was planted outside of our front door of our extension office last year. This is alyssum or sweet alyssum, and it looks like this all summer long. And all summer long when it's sunny outside, you will see um, all kinds of visitors, bees, little wasps, flies um, visiting these plants. It is loaded with white, purple, or pink flowers. The lissom will grow four inches tall with a spread of about eight inches. And it makes a great border plant, or as we would call a spiller, something to fall over the edges of a container. This is just a couple of photos of celosia. There are many types of celosia. They are heat tolerant, really enjoy the warm weather. The flowers can be comb type, feather look, feathery looking or like a flame as we see in the left picture. Celosia can range in height from six inches to four feet. Pictured here, we have the left side is in tins, which is purple flame like flowers growing 18 inches tall, typically covered with pollinators. And dragon's breath is on the right, growing to about two feet tall with these red plumes. This is another one of my favorites because it is drought tolerant. This is lantana. It is, comes in usually a multicolor of red, yellow, pink, white, orange, and purple, and then combinations of those. It will grow two feet by two feet, and it is a butterfly and hummingbird magnet. But very hardy plant, uh, will tolerate not being watered. Um, it will get droopy, and then you can water it and it will pop back. This is salvia. Salvia, um, there are many types of annual salvia. There also are perennial salvias. The ones I'm speaking of specifically here are annuals and they come in colors of red, pink, yellow, purple, orange, and white. Salvia plants will grow one to three feet tall and they are a great source of nectar for butterflies, bees, and hummingbirds. The one that's pictured here is Victoria Blue. Again, if this is in a garden, it will be a buzz all summer long. 
zinnias. Zinnias are, I think, are an old-fashioned favorite. Um, and in speaking of the old-fashioned favorite, the single-flowered form of zinnias are have the most open centers for the butterflies and bees, so they typically attract more of the pollinators. For some of our zinnias, there is benefit in deadheading, so cutting off those old spent flowers, and that will help the plant continue to bloom all summer long. Zinnias can range in height from six inches to three and a half feet, and have colors or bicolors of red, purple, orange, yellow, lavender, white, and green. They also make a really nice cut flower. Natives, for the most part, natives are perennial, so I'm only going to mention a few of those. Um, but what is to note about gardening with natives is that they are adapted for our climate. Typically, most of them have a deep root system, which means once they're established in the ground, they will not need uh, watering and they'll need minimal care. They provide food for insects and other wildlife and once established meaning minimal care. The pic pictured here is purple coneflower. They do get a few insect and disease issues but most gardeners can tolerate the damage. This is butterfly milkweed, as we uh, saw in an earlier picture. As I think most gardeners know by now, milkweed family is the only plants that a monarch butterfly will lay her eggs on for those larvae to eat the milkweed. It is, this is a native, the butterfly milkweed, that grows one to two feet tall blooming typically in early to mid-summer, and then may bloom again later in the summer to fall. This drought-tolerant plant has a deep tap root, which makes it difficult to transplant. So this is one that you'll want to purchase as a small plant and then put it into your garden. Some gardeners, depending on your area, may experience this plant only living one or two years, because frost heaving will um, play havoc on this plant. Also note for your milkweeds plants, they do tend to come up later than many of our other garden plants. So don't uh, leave those, that space undisturbed um, for a while into the spring to make sure that you don't uh, bother the plant as it is emerging. A couple years ago, I actually pulled out a milkweed that was still alive because I, it hadn't come up yet. So caution there. Besides being a host plant for the monarch butterfly larva, the flowers of this plant are enjoyed by bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. This is another milkweed. This is swamp milkweed which uh, is a, also another larval food source for the monarch larva. Again, its flowers are attractive to bees and hummingbirds, and swamp milkweed will grow two to four feet tall. It doesn't take up a large footprint though. The, the plant is, is tall and slender, so you can plant several in a, in a small location. And this mauve pink flowers will bloom from uh, July and August. Goldenrod. Before anybody throws anything at me, goldenrod is not um, the reason for your late summer allergies. Um, that is typically ragweed. Goldenrod is a native that will grow four to six feet tall. So that makes the plant um, not, not a small space plant. But if we look at some of the cultivars that come out, such as Baby Sun, which grows to two feet tall, and Fireworks, which grows two and a half to three feet tall, um, we can have some nice selection for our small space areas. 
Goldenrod gives us the benefit of being a late season bloomer, blooming August till frost, and the nectar um, is enjoyed by bees and butterflies. And this is a host plant for many beneficial insects. The two pictures are on the right are of fireworks. It does have a pretty good spread to it, um, but again, that height is a little bit more controlled. But you can see that it gets its name obviously from the spray of flowers that looks like a firework. Herbs. Growing herbs in our garden, I believe, is a very fun and rewarding experience. And it is great for anyone who enjoys cooking with herbs. Typically, most of our herbs have few, in, few insect and disease problems. And they will provide nectar for bees, butterflies, hooverflies, parasitic wasps, and hummingbirds. Some of our herb plants, such as fennel, dill, parsley, and rue have the uh, leaves that are helpful for um, many of our, several of our larvae. If you're inviting insects to your garden, you'll need to be thinking about doing things a little bit differently for your culinary herbs. As an herb enthusiast, I would tell you the best time to harvest your culinary herbs is just before they flower. But as a pollinator friendly garden person, I would tell you to harvest your herbs as the flowers fade. So what's the difference? Harvesting the herbs before they flower actually gives you the best concentrated oils. However, allowing them to flower is of great benefit to many of the pollinators. So give them a haircut after those blooms start to fade. Here is one that I don't think a lot of people um, think about because it's not necessarily a, it's a culinary herb, but maybe not very well utilized in most, in many of our culinary recipes. And this is borage. Borage like sunny, dry locations. It'll, it's an annual, it'll grow to two feet tall and it can tolerate those poor dry areas. The leaves and stems have bristly hairs on them, but they are edible. Finely shredded borage leaves taste like cucumbers and can be used in salads and cold drinks. The flowers make an attractive garnish. The flowers are also very attractive to bees and butterflies. And very few plants have that bluish purple flower as this one does. Do you keep in mind that borage when it, the flowers dry, it will shatter seeds to the ground and will come up in the same location next year. So it self sows very easily, but it can easily be removed from a garden location as well. I put dill and parsley on the same page. They are not the same plant, but I put them on the same um, slide because both of them are members of the carrot family. And while they're not native uh, plants, they provide a larval food source for the black swallowtail butterflies. Dill is an annual growing two to four feet tall. It is easy to grow to, from seed and also self sows very easily. The yellow flowers are attractive to bees and butterflies. And as mentioned, swallowtail butterflies will lay their eggs on the plant for their larva to eat. During hot, dry weather, dill will go to uh, flower, go to seed, and then bolt. If you have this in a garden location or in a container, make sure you harvest the dill seeds before they shatter. Uh, to do so, uh, clip the stems and then hang them upside down in, in a paper bag, and then you can use the, the seeds in your food dishes. Parsley is a biennial meaning that it flowers the second year. Many gardeners consider this as an annual plant as they want the foliage to harvest. So um, they may be planting this every year. But in the second year, the plant will bloom and pollinators will visit it. 
Again, this is also a larval food source for the swallowtail. Bees, hooverflies, and butterflies are also attracted to the yellowish green flowers. Lavender. I'm not sure that there's any other plant in my garden that, a, that attracts more butterflies during the summer than lavender. Um, I think that could be debated, but it is actually, it's in the summertime loaded with these purple blue flowers and loaded also with bees and butterflies. If you're looking for the one that produces the most nectar in a research project, Grasso, a French hybrid, which is hardy to only zone six, has shown to have more nectar than the others. There are cultivars available for um, further north zones as well. Lavender plants will benefit from a hard prune in the early spring. So if you're growing this as a perennial from year to year, uh, this is one that in late, mid late spring, depending on where you live, you will go out and give this a really good haircut to keep the gro new growth um, appearing in the spring. The plant will become woody and probably will need replaced every three years. Lemon balm. So many of you know that this is a member of the mint family. Don't go running from it though. This is a perennial plant does have a spread to it, but it can be controlled. It is easy to divide and share with others. Um, it also will grow very well in containers. And if you let it grow long enough into the summer and don't cut it back, it will produce white to pale yellow flowers, which are visited by bumblebees and honeybees. But do prune it back after flowering. This plant does need its space, um, as if it's too crowded, it may um, get powdery mildew. Mint, so related to lemon balm, mint is a more aggressive spreader. So that's why in the bottom right photo here, you see that um, they have actually sunk a pot into the ground to contain the mint from growing out into the soil. How uh, this will work as long as you keep the sprigs, the stems from trailing over the side because they can root into the soil. Uh, the top left photo shows a picture of a mint in full bloom um, being visited um, by pollinators. Mint does range in height depending on your selection from 18 inches to two feet tall. Again, will make a really nice ground cover, but doesn't do well with, play well with others, I should say. It needs its space to spread. So sometimes planting in a container is the best option. It can have flower colors of purple, pink, and white. And again, make sure you uh, trim that, those off after those blossoms fade. Pineapple sage is a tender perennial for most of us um, as it's hardy to zone seven, or excuse me, to zone eight. It isn't, so it's considered an annual for most of us, although it will overwinter very nicely if put into a container and then brought inside um, to a basement or a garage over the winter. Pineapple sage will grow to three feet tall and it does have a, uh, fruity of pineapple-y aroma to the leaves, and it has beautiful bright red tubular flowers that are attractive to bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. The added benefit is the leaves and flowers could be used to make teas. Thyme. Thyme is a fun plant, I think, to grow because it is perennial. It does have a bit of a spread, but it's a controlled spread. It can grow depending on the type that you pick, anywhere from a few inches to a foot tall. Makes 
a great uh, border plant or planted in between stepping stones. Also looks very nice in a container um, with a grouping of plants as well. Thyme will benefit from a hard prune in the spring. So make sure that after you start to see green that you give it a good haircut. As you can see in the bottom right picture, uh, pollinators will frequent the white, purple, or pink flowers, um, which are nectar producing. So vegetables and fruits are, I don't think something that most of us think about when we think of pollinators, but I do want you to give uh, vegetables and fruits some consideration into your garden spaces. Um, and there's actually um, several articles out there that you can find on edible landscaping. So if you're looking to combine vegetables and fruits and flowers together, that can be done and can be done very attractively. Some of our vegetables and fruits have separate male and female flowers. So they rely upon pollinators to move that pollen. If you're looking to plant um, some things in small spaces, um, look for bush type, space saving, or great for containers. Um, usually in a garden catalog, that will be um, one of the first things that they list. We also need to think about rat, uh, fruits such as raspberries and blackberries. While these are what they call self-compatible, meaning that they need to be, don't need to be visited by insects to be pollinated, they will produce a much better fruit when fully pollinated by an insect. So here we have cucumbers. One of the main reasons I included cucumbers in this presentation is the first year that I had a honeybee hive at my house. I had more cucumbers in that year than I have ever had growing the same number of plants in the same space. Um, the bees really did, were very helpful in pollinating this crop. Cucumber flowers are nectar and pollen producing. So the bees will visit them, of course, transfer the pollen and uh, give you some nice looking fruits. If you're looking for space saving, salad bush is one that will only get two feet spread and it's a slicing cucumber. Do note with cucumbers, they will produce the best and most consistent crop when they have consistent moisture. If you get bitter cucumbers, many times this means you have low fertility or drought-like conditions or high temperatures. And you'll want to keep picking these every day once they get into production to keep the plant producing nice fruit for you. Melons. Melons such as cantaloupes and watermelon have nectar and pollen producing flowers. When I think of small space gardening, melons probably isn't the first thing that comes to my mind, but there are some nice selections out there for the small space garden. For example, honey bun hybrid cantaloupe grows only a three to six foot vine and many love watermelon grows a three to four foot vine. In this bottom right picture, we have a, I'm not sure what type of cantaloupe, but cantaloupe um, growing in a self-watering container. This particular one is an earth box. I just wanna mention that self-watering containers are great for vegetable plants because they can get that consistent moisture um, throughout the growing season. And sometimes they'll actually produce a more fruitful crop when they have that consistent moisture. So something to consider. But there are some great selections out there. And this, this would be good for the small fruited types of melons would be great for growing vertically. They will also take up less space that way as well.
whether you're growing zucchini, crookneck, stra straight neck, or a patty pan, these plants are visited by pollinating insects that will come to them for their nectar sources and pollen. Um, if you're looking to grow these in containers, there are many bush types available that would be grow great for growing in a container. In the upper right picture, there is a, I call it a blue party tub. Not sure what the right name is, but it's a large blue utility tub with rope handles on it um, with drainage holes in the bottom. And that is the perfect size for growing uh, squash plants. In the bottom right, a bit more of an expensive container option, but this is a water trough um, used for livestock. And these are, are nice because they can be uh, wheelchair height or raise the height up for um, folks that might not want to bend down and get on the ground anymore. Um, these, these are very nice to get that plant up to um, waist high. With your squash plants, your zucchini, crookneck, and straight neck, ideally you will harvest those when they are six to eight inches um, in length and not any bigger as that's when they're going to have the best flavors. And again, remember if you're putting these in containers, make sure those containers have drainage holes. Blueberries. I thought I knew a lot about blueberries uh, until I started doing a little homework for this uh, presentation. And I learned that blueberries can be self-pollinated, but are primarily pollinated by insects. And therefore my three little uh, top hat blueberry plants that I have uh, are always loaded with, with bees and other um, pollinators. Cross-pollination with a compatible, compatible variety will give you the largest fruits, keep that in mind. And if you're ordering these um, or purchasing these, a lot of times they will tell you which um, blueberry uh, cultivars are, self co are compatible with one another. It means that they're blooming typically at the same time. The white flowers are a nectar source for our pollinating insects. The key to growing blueberries is to make sure you have the right pH of soil. So four and a half to five, they are acid loving plants. If you do not have the acid type soils, um, either put in a container garden um, or you're going to need to amend that space for a year or so prior to planting uh, to help get that soil pH where it needs to be. Typically a blueberry plant um, is going to grow five feet tall or more, but there are some very nice selections out there suited for small spaces and containers. Listed here, we have North Blue, North Country, and Top Hat, all um, hardy from zone three to seven, bearing within two to three years, and typically growing around two feet tall or a little bit taller. And the top right picture there is Top Hat, and it is a very small compact plant, um, but you've, as you can see, lots of blooms on it. So it will produce uh, a nice little bowl full of blueberries. A newer grouping of uh, selections on the market is bushel and berry. I'll have to be honest, I've not tried any of these selections, but what is very intriguing is that they bear within one to two years. And again, most of them are on the shorter side, but they have selections that will get anywhere from one foot to four feet tall. Now, if you're thinking about blueberries for containers, just a note um, for you, um, and this comes from Elizabeth Wally, our commercial ag educator. Blueberries require chilling units to be fully fruitful and Otherwise, bud break is delayed with fruitfulness is, and reduced. The plants need to be overwintered where they will receive chilling hours. So this is the number of cumulative hours below 45 degrees. And most of them need to be, have, have that, those chilling hours from 800 to 1,000. So the reason I'm telling you this is that generally is not a problem in the majority of Illinois outdoors, but this could be an issue if you're 
trying to overwinter blueberries in containers. You'll want to make sure that you're overwintering them in a location where the container is not going to um, get, get really, really cold, but will be able to stay below 45 degrees. Um, and they need to do this so that they're, uh, they don't sudden experience or have sudden temperature changes. Um, so an unheated garage might be ideal for overwintering blueberry plants. Raspberries, another plant I really don't think about when I think of small spaces, but uh, there are a few selections on the market that lend themselves to the small spaces and containers. Raspberries have white flowers typically produced during the summer that uh, have nectar and pollen, which is attractive to insects. While they are self-pollinating by wind, uh, you will have the best fruits if they're visited by insects. Care for a raspberry, which is a perennial plant. If you're growing in a container, of course you'll need to find a location to overwinter that container. And then in the spring, whether in a container or a small space garden, you need to make sure that you cut the dead canes to the ground. A selection, which again, I have to admit I have not tried um, by Bushels and Berry is raspberry shortcake. It is thornless, big plus, two to three feet tall, and is hardy for zones four to nine. Strawberries are another perennial crop. This, if you're growing them in a container, I would recommend ever bearing or day neutral strawberries. It will tell you on the label which one they are. Ever bearing type will produce two crops, one in early summer and the second in early fall. And a day neutral will produce fruit throughout the season. For both of these, ever bearing and day neutral, they typically produce a, a little bit smaller strawberry than what we're going to find in the grocery stores. Um, but still very, very tasty. This particular container here I thought was kind of fun. This is a strawberry plant growing with a mint plant. Yes, the mint's getting a little bit aggressive, but makes for a fun name of calling this, the mint was chocolate mint, so the, the container was called chocolate, chocolate covered strawberries. Um, so kind of fun to do. Um, and they will overwinter in the containers provided that you put them in a unheated garage or a cool basement. So that just gives you a very, very small sampling of what you can include in those small spaces that will uh, be beneficial for pollinators. Some of the web references that I use and I also use for other presentations are listed here and one of the handouts that you were provided was a list of these web references. Um, also included in here, woody ornamentals, uh, which I did not discuss, but um, that is a nice publication from the University of Kentucky. So if you would like some more options or more information on a specific plant, you may find these websites to be helpful. For those of you um, looking for a little bit more of a, uh, to take that next step, a little bit of a challenge, I would encourage you to register your pollinator gardens. Uh, that one of the sites that you can do that on is the University of Illinois Extension Pollinator Pocket website out of Champaign County. And they also have a few ideas for small space gardens as well. For those of you looking for a little bit more excitement this summer, I would encourage you to visit the iPollinate University of Illinois Citizen Scientist Research Initiative, um, which encourages gardeners to participate uh, in a U of I research project um, with growing specific pollinating, pollinator plants. If you would like to listen to this presentation again, give me, a, give me some time. This has to be closed captioned, but this will be posted along with all of our other Four Season Gardening Series um, sessions, 
on go.illinois.edu slash four seasons. Oh, that's for to register, excuse me. The recordings are on the four seasons recordings. So you can find those on YouTube um, for any of the presentations you may have missed prior to this.